Welcome everybody. It's great to see so many of you joining us um, from all over the world. So it's, uh, it's the afternoon here. Um, but for those of you in Canada, United States, Latin America, good morning to you. And for those of you in, um, in India um, and thereabouts, um, good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be able to work with such a broad range of teachers from such a broad range of countries. Um, I'm going to be working with Liz, who's going to introduce herself. Thank you very much, Charlie. So I'm Liz and uh, I work at Unrich with Charlie. We're absolutely delighted to, to welcome you to this webinar, as Charlie has already said. Um, Many of you might be aware that this is a repeat of a webinar that we held in June. Um, and we're really fortunate that Trinity College, uh, who have funded the June webinar, have extended their funding, which has allowed us to put on this event for you today. Um, as the title suggests, we're going to be focusing on nurturing successful mathematicians. But before we get started properly, I do need to say to you that we are already recording. Um, and so we would please request that you turn off your microphones and your cameras um, as we are doing so. If you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, you'll find a menu a bit like this, um, probably at the top or bottom of the screen if you're using a laptop or computer. It may look like that if you're on a phone. Um, so you need to please to make sure that the, the microphone and video icons are crossed out, as in that second image that has appeared on the screen. We are going to be um, using the chat facility at various points uh, during today. Um, if you again, if you're on a laptop or computer, you should see in that menu bar that the chat, which you can click on directly. If you're using your phone, then you'll need to click on the, the three dots uh, where it says more to bring up the chat. Um, you could decide, of course, at any stage to, to get rid of the chat if you don't want to be distracted. Um, if you're not happy with the way that your name is displaying, then please do feel free to change it. You can do that by clicking on the three dots um, in the little window where you, you would appear if you were being if your cameras were on. The slides that we're using today will be available to download uh, from the Enrich site and we'll make sure we give you the link to that before the end of the webinar. Additionally, the recording will become available afterwards so that you can refer back to it and share it with colleagues should you wish. We'd like to remind you that in signing up, you, you have agreed to abide by our code of conduct, which, which basically boils down to everybody please being respectful and polite so that we can all enjoy this afternoon's event. If for any reason you have any concerns during the webinar, please feel free to send a private message to me or to Charlie. I'm going to hand over to Charlie now, who's going to introduce, uh, introduce uh, our, our topic today and so that we can get started properly. Thank you, Liz. So we're going to talk about nurturing successful mathematicians. And uh, for those of you who've worked with us in the past, you may have been introduced to this rope model that you can see on your screen. Um, we use this model. This model informs a lot of what we do at Enrich um, when, we're, when we're, we're writing problems. Um, and the model seems to be suggesting that for a rope to be strong, all the threads need to be working together, complementing each other, supporting each other. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the five threads. This is um, a model that came about from the work that Jeremy Kilpatrick was doing with some colleagues uh, some time ago. And uh, uh, the reference to, to the work will be available for you if you want to follow this up. So when Enrich started, there was some concern that the maths that was offered to students was slightly out of balance. There was a lot of focus on conceptual understanding and procedural fluency, but not enough on the other three threads. So let's, let's look at them each in turn. So uh, conceptual understanding, the middle thread there is um, talking about uh, students understanding concepts, operations, relationships, for example, 
um, uh, between, for example, geometric representations and uh, numerical representations or algebraic representations. And a lot of time was spent in classes, students developing procedural fluency, being able to carry out standard procedures efficiently, accurately, um, when it was appropriate. Um, and of course, this is incredibly important, which is why those two threads are in the model. But the feeling was that there wasn't enough focus on strategic competence, on challenging students to work on problems that they hadn't seen before, on developing a range of strategies. So it might be working systematically, it might be trying to simple cases in order to be able to then prepare to try some harder cases, uh, thinking about different ways of representing, but also being able to work collaboratively, knowing when it was important to work collaboratively. Um, and there are also the habits of mind to do with resilience and, uh, and being resourceful and so on. So uh, we wanted to produce resources that required students to think strategically, as well as giving them an opportunity to uh, develop their, their, their fluency and required them to have conceptual understanding. But that was not all. There was a fourth strand, the adaptive reasoning. So in a lot of enriched problems, you'll see us asking students to, um, uh, that will require them to use logical thinking, perhaps to explain their reasoning, maybe to justify why they're doing something. Um, in some cases, to even prove that what they've discovered or what they found out is indeed correct. So that feels a really important aspect of working mathematically. And then the fifth strand, and the fifth strand is the one that I always think is the one that perhaps inf influenced us to become maths teachers, the productive disposition. And there are two aspects to it. One is we want our students to leave our classrooms, uh, our schools, feeling really positive about maths, feeling this is a subject that uh, is interesting, is useful, that they can imagine wanting to carry on studying and engaging with when they leave school. But also, we want them to feel positive about their ability to make progress at this subject. Carol Dweck talks in mindset about having a growth mindset. So we want students to feel that it is possible to make progress with perhaps, you know, the, the persevering resilience, working collaboratively and so on. So when Enrich started, we were trying to create problems, create resources that challenge students to use as many of these characteristics that we know uh, we see in, in successful mathematicians. And today what we'll do is we'll work on a couple of problems and, um, and hopefully you'll see what this means in practice. Now, we've taken this model and then adapted it into a, a student-friendly, a pupil-friendly model. And Liz is gonna talk about this, which is uh, uh, something that we've created very recently. Thanks, Charlie. Yes, so what you see before you at the moment is an, an image that we have um, developed recently at Enrich um, in the hope that we could uh, encourage children themselves to be on board with these five strands. Um, we're calling these our, our five key ingredients that characterize a successful mathematician. You may hear us during this afternoon use the word ingredients and strand sort of interchangeably, but we, but we mean these five elements of the model. We've tried to come up with some images to, to help uh, students understand the, these five better. And we've tried to describe the five in, in, some, in some more child-friendly language. So let me just really briefly take you through those. If we start at the, the top, the sort of left of our image, those um, circles connected with, with straight lines in dark blue, that's representing our understanding. Uh, ingredient, if you like. So we'd love students to be able to identify that maths is a network of linked ideas, um, that they can connect what they uh, already 
no to new mathematical thinking that they undertake. Um, going round to the right, the top right there, the purple toolbox, um, this of course represents the tools. So here we have, as Charlie was uh, suggesting earlier, here this is the kind of thing I, I, I know that I've got a bank of tools that I can draw on. So I perhaps, for example, I know different ways of calculating. Um, I, could, I could perform a subtraction calculation in several different ways. Um, and I recognize that if I practice those different ways, it will help me become a better, better mathematician. If we carry on round clockwise, that red image represents one of those slidey puzzles, which you may have come across. So this is problem solving. Um, as Charlie alluded to, we feel that very, it's very likely that children in our classrooms will, will be very aware that understanding and tools are a big part of mathematics. But how much they're aware of these other three ingredients um, are down to you and your classrooms, essentially. So this third one, problem solving, do our students understand that problem, is, uh, that problem solving is an, is an essential element of mathematics? We'd love them to be able to use their current knowledge uh, to help work, work towards a solution, particularly in the context of being presented with a problem that they've never seen before. The bottom image there, the cogs, represents reasoning. So um, we'd love our children to think that maths is, is a logical subject and that they feel empowered to, to be able to explain their thinking to somebody else um, once they've convinced themselves that, that their answer, their solution is correct. Um, and finally, going around to the, uh, the green face, the, um, the arrow perhaps indicating the passage of time, um, this represents what we're calling attitude. So um, maths makes sense to me. Um, I, I believe it's worth me spending time on doing some maths and I can enjoy it, I can enjoy it. And as Charlie said, um, linking with the Carol Dweck model, I, I know that I'm not naturally good or naturally bad at maths. If I work hard at maths, then, then I can get better at it. So this, as we say, is our child-friendly version, which has been adapted from Kilpatrick's rope model that Charlie share with, shared with you. So our intention in, in uh, sharing this with you now is that we hope that you can begin to use this model with your children in your classes um, and to create an environment in which perhaps reflecting using this tool becomes a natural part of mathematics lessons. What we intend to do now is to work on a couple of tasks, as Charlie mentioned, um, and after each one, we'll look at this model and reflect on what we have done as learners of mathematics, as we've worked on the tasks ourselves, to give you a sort of a sense of how it might be used in the classroom. Um, in order to do that, we'd love to introduce you now to our first task. Um, here you have a, a, a screenshot of the Enrich homepage. Hopefully that's familiar to many of you. As primary teachers, I would suggest that the best place for you to be going to routinely is our primary teacher homepage, which you can access there in that top green button. So the primary teacher homepage looks like this. Incidentally, if you haven't explored this, I'd heartily recommend the purple box takes you to all our tasks that link directly with the curriculum. And that pink box in the top middle gives you access to the, the resources that you might want to use if you're particularly wanting to focus on, for example, mathematical habits of mind. You can see there the list in the pink box. For the purposes of today, though, we're going to tackle a couple of tasks that we published in a feature back in June. So if you wanted to access those in your own time, you'd need to click on this link here, which will take you to our past features page. So here's a screenshot of just the, the top of the page to give you a sense. Each of those images represents a feature. So by a feature, we mean a group of linked tasks around a particular theme, and sometimes also including one or more articles for you as teachers. It will be uh, no surprise to you, I'm sure, to know that the particular feature we're going to be uh, looking at today is this one, the Nurturing Successful Mathematicians feature. So having come down those various layers, here we are. So. Um, the rope image at the top there, of course, is, uh, is alluding to the Kilpatrick model that Charlie talked us through. This feature contains an, an article, which is the top left image you can see uh, below the descriptive text. And then you've got four groups of tasks 
which you can explore, um, each for a particular purpose. The tasks that we're going to look at uh, today both come from the uh, competitive to collaborative group, which is that one there. Having described how we get there, I'm now going to pass you over to Charlie and we're going to do some mathematics together. Charlie. Thank you, Liz. Um, so before we start, um, I just want to give you a minute to copy what you can see on the screen. So those um, eight boxes um, and the signs in between uh, in the middle of each line. This is not going to be a geometric exercise, so your boxes don't have to be exact squares. Okay, and then what I'm going to do, I've got a, a, a 10 sided dice uh, with the numbers not to nine. So I'm going to roll the dice and um, I'm going to ask Liz to fill in my, uh, my squares. And you can do the same. Um, so at this stage, uh, don't worry, I haven't given you any rules or any instructions or uh, any objectives. So you could just uh, fill the squares in as random way as you like. Actually, it'd be quite nice to have um, a variety. Uh, so don't feel that um, there's any purpose uh, in this first round that we're going to do. And then I'll clarify the instructions um, next time round. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to roll the dice. The first number I get is um, a two. And Liz, could you put the two for me um, in the tens column in the bottom left, please? Um, okay, I'm going to roll the dice again. And uh, this time I've got a three. And in this case, can you put the three in the units column of the bottom right hand? So if you could be doing something similar with your twos and threes, I'm not expecting you to copy what I'm doing, um, but I'd like you to be uh, filling your squares in whatever way you like. Okay, here we go. Uh, the next number is a six. Can we have the six in the top left hand corner, please? The next number is a five. Can we have that next to the six, please? Next number is a one. Um, can we have that below the five, please? The next number is a four. Um, can we have the four next to the three, please? Um, I've got a six. Can we have the six above the four? Thank you. And the last number is a three. Okay. I don't. Okay. Um, so I hope that wasn't too fast and you got a chance to put your numbers in and I imagine you've got your numbers in a slightly different arrangement to the ones that I have. So let me just clarify what we're trying to do here. Um, we've got two sentences, the top sentence and the bottom sentence. And in each case, we've got two two digit numbers and there is a less than sign between them. So in the first, in the top sentence, I've got 65 is less than 63. And Liz is gonna tell me that's wrong and put a cross next to that. Uh, in the bottom sentence, I've got 21 is less than 43. And that is correct. So I hope I'm gonna get a smiley face there. Uh, and Liz is smiling, so that's good. Um, and the way we're going to score this is that we're going to have the score in whichever sentences are correct, so wherever there's a tick, and it's only going to be 
the two digit number that is on the left hand side. So what appears in the blue boxes. So in this case, I get a score of 21. And if both sentences have been correct, then I would have got the sum of the two digit number in the top blue boxes and the two digit number in the bottom. So if, if the last dice that I roll hadn't been a three and had been an eight, for example, then 65 would have been less than 68 and my total would have been 65 plus 21. Um, so let's play the game again. Uh, so Liz, I think you might be able to erase uh, what I've done. So while Liz erases that, perhaps you can draw your squares and less than signs so that you've got a blank, just like um, Liz has on her screen. Okay, and um, I'm gonna roll the dice again and the score is going to be whatever two digit numbers we have in the blue boxes of the sentences that are correct. Okay, so here we go. Uh, my first one is a three. Uh, can we put it in the top left-hand corner, please? Next one is a six. Can I put this in the tens column in the top sentence, please? The next one is a two. Can I have this next to the six, please? The next one is a one. Can I have this below the two, please? Next one's a three. Um, I'll have it below the other three, please. The next one's a four. Oh, can I have that below the six, please? I think I'm going to have two correct sentences this time. I might get two smiley faces. Okay. Um, next number is a nine. I'll have that um, in the bottom row, please. And last number is a seven. Okay, so Hopefully you've managed to fill in your eight squares in the time I gave you. And the top sentence says 37 is less than 62. So that's correct. And the bottom sentence, is, sentence says 39 is less than 41. That's also correct. So this time my total is going to be 37 plus 39. I get the sum of those two two digit numbers. So I get a total of 76. Now, um, it might be nice to see what everybody else got. So I wonder if you can score your game in the same way that Liz has scored mine and can you use the chat facility to post the total number of points that you got? You don't need to tell us, or actually, please don't tell us which numbers you added up. Um, just tell us what your total was. Some people seem to have done better than me, Liz.
That's great. Okay. Some people managed to score more than 100. Wow. Okay, so our next challenge, I think, appear, is about to appear on your screen. Now that you've seen the scores that some people got, can you try and recreate what arrangements of digits they might have that resulted in that total? So you might be intrigued. How did somebody get, I can see that Donna scored exactly 100. Ooh, how did she do that? Or you might be interested in somebody who scored a little bit more than you or just one more than you or a lot more than you. Can you have a go at trying to recreate how they might have arranged their digits to uh, achieve the results that they've got? I'm gonna give you a minute to, to play around with that. And, and if you think that you, you can work out which four digits were used on the left-hand side, then um, you might want to uh, post that in the chat as well. Ah, somebody did work out how to get 100. I'm not going to tell you what they've said. Don't look at the chat if you don't, if, if you're thinking about it and don't um, want to have your, your, uh, your moment of uh, success spoiled for you. Oh. I can also see that a hundred can be achieved in more than one way. Different people have achieved a hundred in different ways. That's great. Okay, I, I think we've got a third question, don't we, Liz? Okay, so our next question is, if we were asked you to try and maximize your score, so if you knew the eight digits in advance, how would you go about trying to arrange the digits? So um, imagine you had the eight digits that we've just uh, achieved with our dice. Um, what would your strategy be? So uh, we're interested in the reasoning rather than on what the total is. I'm not, I'm not very interested in what the maximum total is at this stage. But how might you reason, or how might you want your students to reason? How, what would you hope they would be talking about or saying or discussing or suggesting? And again, feel free to use a chat to share your thinking on this. Okay, um, so a lot of people talking about the importance of the numbers in the tens digits. 
and also talking about putting small numbers in the units, uh, digit columns, squares, places, also talking about thinking a little bit about probability and chance. Um, so knowing that perhaps if you put a very big number in the tens digits on the number on the left, you might struggle to get a, a bigger number on the right. Um, so this, I think, might then lead to a discussion. Um, and I think we've got a question four on this slide. Uh, so what we'd like you to do is think about what might happen if you've been playing this game with your class, what kind of questions might crop up? What kind of discussions might take place with your students? How might you or how might they want to follow up what we've done so far into the next bit of the lesson or into the next lesson? Where, where, where could this go? What, what might your students be curious about? And again, we invite you to share um, your thoughts about this. Um, I don't know whether we've mentioned this. You will be able to save everything that's appearing on the chat at the end of this session. So it's really difficult to be thinking and typing into the chat and reading what everybody else is saying, given that there are over 100 people, possibly over 200 people, I don't know. Uh, so don't panic, don't worry. Um, there will be time at the end to just um, save the text file and, um, and then you'll be able to read what people have been saying in your own time. Um, So lots of comments here about strategies and recognizing that there is this conflict. You want your sentences to be correct. So the number on the left has got to be smaller than the number on the right. On the other hand, if your numbers on the left are too small, you don't get a very good score. So you want the numbers in blue to be as high as possible, but not so high that the sentence ends up being incorrect which is what happened to me the first time round. So a lovely tension here and nice discussions that might take place with students in the classroom about how they might resolve this, ten this tension and what strategies they might have. And one nice way of playing a game like this is that instead of playing one against one, you have two against two, which forces students to discuss, collaborate with their partner, share ideas and strategies and so on, um, articulate their, their thinking. The, there's some comments about zero um, and whether I had zero uh, in my dice. Yes, I did have a, a zero to nine. Uh, uh, but of course, you could play this with a one to six dice. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's clearly understood what kind of a dice you have, that's fine. And then people talking about how you might take this further people talking about, well, you might have a three digit number against a three digit number. Um, Liz and I were talking earlier, you might have three pairs of two digit numbers. So you have a two digit number that needs to be smaller than the next two digit number, which needs to be smaller than the one on the far right. And what do you do? So you've got six squares in a sentence to fill in. So lots of sort of follow up possibilities. 
Okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm going to move pass on to Liz now, so she can talk about how this work can be interpreted and linked to the child-friendly rope model that we created. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, here we are, have our um, model again, the five key ingredients um, uh, and the, the text reminding you about how we might define each of those. Um, I'm going to put up a poll now, which we'd like you just to take a moment to fill in. Um, which of these five key ingredients do you feel were part of your experience of working on the less is more task? If you could, you can choose more than one uh, of, of these options. So if you could complete that, that would be really helpful. Once you've done so, if you wanted to give any more information in the chat, if you wanted to expand on your reasons for choosing a particular ingredient or ingredients, that would be great. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just 10 more seconds. If you haven't completed the poll and would like to, please do. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. Here we are. Ah, so okay, so reasoning has come up slightly on top as the, as the, the most chosen option but actually they are pretty comparable. I was trying to keep an eye on the chat coming through. Many of you mentioned that you felt all of them uh, were part of your experience. And I, I think it's interesting, you've also made the point about um, not all necessarily to the same degree though. And, and it might depend on the individual child, which is what we will come to uh, considering right at the end of the webinar when we, when we think a bit more about how you might use one of these tools. Um, so, thank you very much for, for doing that. Let me stop sharing that poll. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, just have a very quick look at what that uh, activity looks like on the Enrich site. Here it is. You can see if you didn't already know that uh, we have an interactivity which you could use to simulate a dice um, or a spinner. Um, and every activity on Enrich has got teachers resources to give you some ideas about how you could introduce it in the classroom. So do take a look at those if you didn't know those existed. I'm now going to hand back to Charlie because we're going to have a go at a second task and then reflect in a similar way using our, our learner model. Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, we've got a problem called strike it out. Um, and on the website, the problem starts with a little video. So we're going to show you the video. Don't be alarmed if you can't hear anything. There is no sound. And the challenge for you is to try and figure out what you think the rules of the game might be. And at the same time, you might want to think about how you might win.
Okay. Um, so if we were in a classroom, we'd have a discussion, we'd expect children to input what they think the rules are. Um, we don't have very much time, so I, I'm going to just reassure you in terms of, ooh, that's disappeared. Uh, uh, um, the, we, we are using each number, uh, to, we use we, we we make sentences as we go along, uh, and every time we use a number, we cross it out because then we can't use it again. Uh, the The last number that gets used on every line is the one that gets used at the start of the next one. So we finished with fourteen. Uh, when fourteen got written, uh, it, because it was finished, it had a circle around it, and then when it got used. The second time it had a line through it. Um, in the example that you can see on the screen, you've got plus minus plus minus with red player always adding and blue player always subtracting. Um, that, that was slightly unfortunate with the number that we chose. That wasn't so ex supposed to be a rule of the game. So you, whenever it's your turn, you can either use plus or minus. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. And of course, uh, uh, the, purpose, the, the point of the game is to be able to carry on and the, and the loser, unfortunately, is the person who can't find a sentence to write. So um, Liz, can we just carry on uh, a couple of lines? Um, maybe if I can be red and you can be blue, um, can you, are you able to scribble on there? So I think I could have, um, oh, there's a two and a 15 that hasn't been used. So could I have 17 take away two? Equals 15. So I'm assuming you're gonna cross out the two because you're, we use that. And 15 is what we've ended up with. So you're gonna put a circle around the 15 and then it'll be your turn in blue. So you've got 15 minus nine. So cross out the 15, cross out the nine equals six. So a circle around six. And now I've got to start with six. Um, Okay, so six add 13 is 19. So again, you need to cross out the six for me, please, and the 13 and put a circle around the 19. And I think I might have blocked you. Okay. Okay, so with a class of students, you might play, get them to play this several times. Um, but this section was called from competitive to collaborative. So I could imagine now setting students the challenge and asking them to create a string of calculations and they could work on this together, crossing numbers out as they go along using exactly the same rules that we have done. And the challenge is, uh, to create as long uh, a string as they can. And we'd like to give you that challenge. So if you write the numbers naught to 20 on your paper and then write some calculations that use the numbers, how long a string can you make? If you're trying to make it as long as possible, how many? Uh, and then in the chat, could you post how many numbers are left when you get stuck? So I think when Liz and I played the game just now, I think there might've been six numbers left. Uh, so let us give you a couple of minutes to do this and see what length of strings you manage, how many numbers you're left with at the end.
Okay, so I'm going to stop you here, if you don't mind, because I want to give Liz a little bit of time to think about what you've been doing and how that relates to the rope, the, the, the child-friendly rope model. But a little bit of homework. A lot of people have been left with six numbers or four numbers or eight numbers, and that hasn't surprised me. Um, because I think whenever you get stuck, you're always left with an even number of numbers. So it's, so I possibly didn't do a very good job at explaining the rules of the game because some people have ended up with an odd number of numbers, which seems a little bit odd to me, apologies. <laughs> so after, to, after the session, you might want to go and have a look um, at, uh, at the problem again on the site. Uh, remember that there is a zero at the beginning of the line. So there are 21 numbers altogether. And one of the challenges that I might, we might set, um, okay, a lot of people are saying that they forgot about the zero. Okay, uh, I did wonder whether we should have had the zero to 20 line back on the screen for you. So perhaps my instructions weren't all uh, so unclear. Um, so one of the questions that we might ask is, can you um, create a string that uses all 21 numbers? Uh, but that's gonna be homework rather than something to work on today. I want Liz to have a chance to get you to think a little bit about how this work links to the, the model. Thank you very much, Charlie. Sorry to have uh, cut you off, but we hope we whetted your appetite for, for more mathematics later uh, in the day. So here we go. We return to our, our learner model, our five key ingredients. Once again, I'd be really interested, please, to share the, a poll with you. Um, it's coming up again on your screen. Which of the five do you feel were part of your experience working on this task? Strike it out. If you could fill that in, that would be wonderful. Um, again, you might like to post in the chat. You could post in the chat, perhaps this time, some comments that you feel students might make when reflecting in this way. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be quite harsh and literally only give you a minute or so. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I'm going to close the poll now. Apologies for those of you who haven't quite had chance to complete it. Let's have a little look at the results this time. Ah, oh, so now it's interesting. Again, um, there seems to be a feeling that all five of these are, are important. This time, problem solving has edged slightly forward. Um, I've, um, I've had a quick look at the chat. Many of you were mentioning the reasoning in terms of the uh, work, working out you know, why you, you could or couldn't cross off more numbers. Um, and the systematic working in terms of problem solving, I see Annette has mentioned there. Um, thank you very much for your, for your thoughts on that. That's really hopeful, helpful. Um, uh, and I'm glad that you like the homework there, Vali. That's, uh, that's, that's nice to know. So I'm going to stop sharing that poll and uh, return to the to the slides um, very quickly. Here we go. This is Strike It Out on the website. The silent video is available, um, as Charlie mentioned. Again, we've got the teacher's resources. Uh, now, this time, we'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there are some 
students, there are some children's thoughts about this game and the strategies that they've had, the reasoning uh, in terms of whether they can make, um, uh, 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 they can use all the numbers on the zero to 20 number line. If you didn't know that we publish student solutions, then now you do. Um, our live tasks are available, they're open until the end of the day on Monday. There is still time to submit your, your learner's work to our live tasks. Certificates are available when you su submit and you can request extra, an extra certificate for those children whose work is actually published on the Enrich site. So, so do, do remember that, that's relatively new. Um, returning again to the, to the feature, um, I'd like to just remind you that we've only looked at tasks from the from competitive to collaborative group. So do explore the others. Um, and here is the article that we mentioned near the beginning. Um, this is what it looks like at the, at the foot of the article. You've got the full reference to the Kilpatrick rope model that Charlie described at the beginning. But we just wanted to show you in a little more detail the, um, the self-assessment tool that we've, we've developed using this model. Here you can see that we've offered you three different downloadable sheets, um, which you may wish to use in the classroom with your learners. Uh, just to give you a little sense of what that could be like, here is one of them. I'm just going to get my pen tool up. Um, Let's imagine that um, uh, if we're thinking about the strike it out game, uh, we're going to be focusing on some addition and subtraction. What you, what you might like to do is, is offer a sheet like this to, to your class and, and invite them to do some self-assessment before you do any teaching. So I might decide that um, addition and subtraction, um, well, you know, I, I, I feel like I understand what addition and subtraction is all about, but I... I'm, I know that I'm not very good at applying that to my to problems and it's really dull. So I'm going to fill in a bit like that. I could, I could join up those to make a polygon, which isn't very clear. And that would give a snapshot in time of how I feel those five ingredients are developing. But then, uh, as a teacher, you, you'd offer a series of tasks. You'd want to, to, to uh, do some teaching uh, around addition and subtraction using possibly Strike It Out as one of your uh, resources. And then maybe you, you offer the, the children um, the sheet again, uh, maybe in a different color, let's take blue. Um, having had that teaching, I then might reflect again. Okay, so yeah, my, my, my understanding ha has deepened further but I've had so much chance to practice the different ways of calculating that actually I feel quite confident I could draw on those. And, you know, I managed to work out um, that, well, I'm not going to give it away. I was about to tell you, but I managed to work out with some reasoning, some of the final challenges my teacher gave me on that strike it out challenge. Be because I was invited to explain to my partner what my thinking was. I feel like I've really got better at that. And you know what? I really quite enjoyed it. So now I could draw those end points together to create a new polygon, if you like, a new shape, which then you as the teacher and your learners could see, well, yes, I've made a bit of progress over those couple of weeks. Um, of course, I think the important point here is this would give you a snapshot of the starting point, the end point, it's important to recognize, isn't it, that, that perhaps we wouldn't always, a student wouldn't always make progress over that um, stage, they might stagnate a bit, but then you would be alerted to it. Um, it might also be interesting to compare their um, self-assessments in different areas of the curriculum. Are they, are they much happier about mathematics in, in a number environment than in a geometrical one, for example? Charlie, I don't know whether you wanted to uh, chip in at all there, just uh, briefly. Well, what you said is, is spot on. Um, it's nice to be able to get have a snapshot. It seems real value in having a snapshot of how students are feeling, perhaps at the beginning of a topic, as they progress through a topic, at the end of a topic, during, a, uh, and to be able to compare. Um, uh, and in particular, the attitudinal one would be quite interesting to know how are children feeling um, but also there may be times that they can use the tools 
but they, they, they're using the tools without much understanding. And so they may score highly on the tools, they're getting everything right, but they don't really understand what's going on. And so there's a sort of disjoint there. And as a teacher, it'd be useful to, uh, to know that that's how the students are feeling about it. Thanks, Charlie. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we just want to make very clear that this is um, a relatively new model for us. As we said, we developed it um, and published it back in June. And so we're offering you one way that we think it, it could work and these sheets could be used in the classroom. But obviously, you will have your own ways. And as, as we use it more with teachers and learners, we'll come to further ways as well. If you are on Twitter um, and just going back without my pen tool, there we go. If you're on Twitter uh, uh, and you try out this uh, model with your learners, we'd love to hear from you. Do use the um, hashtag EnrichLive. Um, in case you don't know, that's our uh, Twitter handle. Um, Twitter is probably the best place to, to keep abreast of what we're doing, but you might also want to subscribe to our newsletter uh, by, it's an email newsletter if you don't already. As you can sense, we're coming to the end of the webinar. Apologies for running very slightly over time. Um, thank you so much for your participation. Um, it, it, knowing there are people out there, even if we can't see you, uh, and your thoughtful contributions on the chat make a huge difference to, uh, to Charlie and me here um, uh, uh, behind the scenes, if you like. Um, we mentioned that we would put uh, uh, the slides up. So a PDF of the slides will appear on that page um, by the end of today. And we will be putting the video recording um, up on the Enrich site too. And we'll let you know where that is. We mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that it's been funded by Trinity College here in Cambridge. Um, and it's really important that we're able to give uh, them to report back um, and of course for us to, to understand how we might do a better job in the future. So please, please, please could you complete that uh, evaluation form. I will post a link to it in the chat uh, very shortly. As Charlie mentioned, if you'd like to save the chat, now might be the time to do so. Uh, you could do it using the three dots, probably the bottom left, I think, of your chat window. Um, I will say goodbye and then I'll pass over to Charlie to say goodbye properly too. Thank you very much indeed. We look forward to seeing you again at another event in the future. Thank you, Liz. On, on my chat window, it's uh, the three dots on the bottom right that uh, how, give you the safe chat option. Um, like Liz said, really nice to have the opportunity to work with so many of you uh, uh, from so many different countries. Um, I'm seeing some of the comments in the chat. Uh, really pleased that you've enjoyed it. Um, do uh, please fill in the feedback form because then we can reassure Trinity that this was money well spent and, um, and maybe they'll fund us to do, do some more of these. Um, and like Liz said, everything that we've done is, going to, is freely available and will be up on, on the page. So, um, Goodbye to some of you and I hope you have a nice lunch and goodbye to some of you and hope you have a nice tea and goodbye to some of you. Uh, uh, sweet dreams. <laughs> bye bye from both of us. <laughs>